Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as many of you, being of this profession, will understand, we are trained to listen and record, not to speak. So an occasion of this kind is quite inhibiting. But I have to say, if I have to stand before an audience of my peers, I'd as soon do it on this occasion as any I can think of. I want to speak about the friend and the colleague um, whose memory we honor tonight uh, and in whose name we give these well-deserved awards. Ten summers have passed since that dreadful day in May of 2000 when we heard what had happened on that lonely road in Sierra Leone. I was invited by Sabina and the family, along with quite a number of those present tonight, to go to Washington for a private farewell to Kurt. Um, I found the occasion profoundly difficult, as I'm sure many of us did, and went out of the chapel to get some fresh air, where I met a rather rumbustious fellow in a silver suit who was having a cigarette, who introduced me, uh, himself to me as one of Kurt's high school football mates. And as we talked, and I asked him, to what can we attribute, how can we understand the extraordinary person that Kurt Schalk was? He said, I think I can help you answer that question. He said, it'll be an hour or so before everybody moves up to the beautiful green lawn in the north end of Washington, which is Kurt's resting place. He said, there are a couple of things I'd like to show you. So we drove into the suburbs of the north end of Washington, D.C. We went and looked at the house where Kurt had grown up, uh, revealing in itself um, a modest and not privileged background. And then we went to another place nearby, which was the home, as he told me, of Kurt's football coach. Knocked on the door. The coach's wife answered and took us through to the veranda at the back, where the coach, by, would, by then I would say probably in his 80s, was sitting in a wicker chair looking out over his garden. First thing I liked about him was that he wasn't the slightest bit impressed or even terribly interested in the fact that the New York Times had come by uh, to see him and ask him a question. And I asked him, I said, my friend here tells me that much of what I admired in Kurt, he learned from you. So what were the lessons that you taught Kurt? And he said, he said, well, that's a goddamn simple question, he said. He said, there are only three rules. The same three rules, he said, every fall, I tell the team. He said, number one, give of your best. Number two, never make a promise that you don't fulfill. I was beginning to feel a little uneasy because I wasn't sure that I could pass either of those two tests. <laughs> And then he said, number three, and the most important of all, he said, always show up on time. <laughs> and I certainly didn't meet that test either. Show up on time. If you showed up, if you committed yourself with Kurt to go reporting in Sarajevo or in other distant places of war, and you said that you would meet him in the hotel restaurant at 8 o'clock, if you turned up at three minutes past 8, he was sitting there drumming the table with his fingers. He'd look at his watch. He wouldn't say anything. He'd just look at his watch. He was a man who, in all things, set the highest standards. That might make him sound like a prude. He wasn't at all. Kurt had come to our business relatively late. I think I'm right in saying that he was a full-time journalist for approximately 10 years before he died. And I think that part of the explanation of what an extraordinary man he was lies in the fact that after he went up to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, with Bill Clinton as it happens, uh, he did many other things. He had a broad experience of life which is uh, unusual in our profession. Um, he used to tell me that he had gone from being the executive director, as I recall, of the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York, or the Mass Transit Authority, with 35,000 employees, he said to this, waving his notebook and his ballpoint pen, 
He told me that he had been interviewed by a reporter from the New York Times, a woman as it happened, in his MTA role, and that uh, when she left, he thought to himself, she has a more interesting job than I do. And he did this extraordinary thing. He walked out of the MTA, and he, Sean would know, Sean is close a friend of, of Kurt's, um, as Kurt had, um, and offered himself to Reuters as a freelance journalist in the no-fly zone of northern Iraq. I met him when he arrived in Sarajevo. I'd been a foreign correspondent by that time for 25 years. Kurt immediately became the dean, the unofficial dean of the press corps. Uh, the person to whom everybody looked because he set an example in all things. He was a superb reporter. He was first and last on the job. He was, as Sean has said, extraordinarily persistent. He was very tough. He just didn't give in. He was a really first-class journalist. But to me, it wasn't that that set him apart. What set Kurt Schork apart? And I mean by this that I never met anybody in our profession who impressed me more. I think there are many here who would agree with this. What impressed me about him was Kurt Short, as I think, not alone the journalist, the first-class foreign correspondent, but Kurt Short, the citizen, and Kurt Short, the American. The two concepts are really one and the same. Kurt Schork understood something which many of us, I think, learn only hardly and over a very long period of time, which is it's not enough in these hard places just to do the job and meet the deadline. That we go there as citizens, we go there with great privilege, and we go there with the potential to do real and not just imagined and virtual good. We can change things. We do change things, hopefully, with our reporting. But that wasn't enough for him. He saw misery, and he resolved to relieve it. I could give you many examples of this, but the most outstanding one was on a Saturday night in Sarajevo, I'm thinking probably sometime in the winter of 92, 93. He came and he knocked on the doors of 10 or 12 of us and said, do you know about the old folks' home? No, we said, we don't know about the old folks' home. Well, he explained, there's a salient, a Serb-controlled salient close to the United Nations building, and at the point of this salient, abutting Muslim-held territory, there's an old folks' home in which, and I broadly remember the figures, there were 350 people at the time that the siege of Sarajevo began. This was in April, May of 1992. By the time Kurt spoke of this, which more or less dates it, some six or nine months had passed. The winter had set in. More than a hundred people in this old folks' home had already died. Many of them of starvation, of hypothermia, of neglect. The people who were supposed to look after them had fled. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which, by the way, I would say, is of all UN agencies the one that many of us here tonight <coughs> would most admire, had decided, so Kurt told us, that they couldn't handle the problem because these people were not refugees. Uh, they weren't, I think they said, they're not even displaced persons. They're in their place of residence. What can we do? So Kurt said to us, if the United Nations can't handle this problem, we can handle it. And he formed us into a platoon, and we went to that old folks' home with buckets and brushes and clean linen and wood to make fires. And the days that ensued, until this became a story in itself and caused Jose Maria Mendeluce, the European head of the UNHCR, to fly in and actually cause something to be done about this, which was to extract the survivors, the some 200 survivors, and take them to an abandoned hospital in the Serb-held area to the south of the city. I have to say those days were amongst, I think not amongst, were the most satisfying days of my career the feeling that we had actually done some good. Now, Kurt was not grandstanding. He did these sorts of things again and again. He didn't mind letting you know 
that if you thought that meeting your deadline and making page one was a full life, um, he, he held that, not in contempt, he wasn't a person who felt contempt, but that he expected more of you. To be a friend of Kurt was to face demands. I don't remember, as I said when I began, ever meeting anybody quite like him. I think now that it's wise when you meet somebody like that, and how many of us have had the experience of thinking this too late, it's wise to think that they are a gift that is limited in time. So extraordinary a person, you're lucky to meet once in your life. That was the Kurt Schork that I knew. To win a prize in his name, I would say, is the highest honor. There are other journalism prizes which carry the names of, of people famed in our business for one thing or another. But I can't think of any prize named for anybody which carries more honor than this. Kurt Schork, journalist, citizen, and America, we miss you, we love you, and it's an enormous privilege for me to be able to stand here tonight and say this.